right, well, good evening. I'm glad to see you all here. Um, let's, I'm going to go back over to Romans chapter 12, where we have been starting. Romans. Romans 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. <clears throat> It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And that's what we've been opening up with. I don't even know when my dad started opening up with it, but that's what we've been opening up with, the idea of that we cannot be conformed to this world, that we have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And we have been talking about righteousness and getting hobo thoughts out of your brain and changing the way you think. And then I've been looking at the last couple times I talked, I talked about holiness and being set apart. My mom talked about honor, different thoughts that you should have. But as I've been... As I've been praying and seeking the Lord, he's kind of taken me a different direction, but it still has to do with your thoughts. Because I don't know if you know this, but this is where everything goes on right here. This is where the battle goes on. The battle goes on in your thoughts. You are stuck in a body that is dying. You have a spirit inside of you that is brand new, and you've got your mind that's in between the two, trying to act as the kind of the go-between, between between your body, between what you see out here and the eternal. And your mind is where you win or where you lose the battle. And I don't know how many of you know that, but that's where I win or lose the battle. I have so many thoughts that come into my mind on a daily basis. There's a constant, constant battle for your thoughts, for what you're looking at, for what you're thinking about, for where your attention is. Uh, and, and we live in a day and age with so many distractions. I mean, we have, I, I was at a, a women's conference last summer, and they said, in a, in a day, you receive more information in one day than your grandmother did in like her, I can't even remember if it was like a year. You receive more information in one day because everywhere you look, there is constant, everything is at your fingertips. Everything's right there. And we got to be really purposeful what we put in and what we think about. And so one of the things that God has been showing me and dealing with me on, and man, it is not it has not always been pleasant, and I am still working on this, but we have been, I've been looking at the idea of thanksgiving and gratitude. And I told you a couple of weeks ago, that's where I thought he was going to take me, and that's what this week came up, that gratitude. So I think what I'm going to title this, because Michael told Michael I wanted to title my own sermon this week, what my title is going to be is Gratitude Looks Good on You. And we're going to talk about gratitude and why it is important. Yeah, gratitude looks good on you in the life of the believer. So go over with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. And this is going to be your favorite verse. You're going to love this. Just get ready to shout when you hear this. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16. This is like everybody's favorite. I think everybody's favorite verse. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. We're catching up in the back. The computer system is slow, so apparently it takes a minute. All right, y'all are just going to have to trust me and find your Bibles and go with it till they catch up. All right, it says rejoice sometimes. Always. Rejoice when you've had a really good day. Always. Rejoice when everything's going really well. Can you tell my kid has been listening to this? Rejoice. It says rejoice always. Now, this is a good one, too. Pray without ceasing. I'm just going to stop you right there. Somebody might say, how do you pray without ceasing? I mean, that means, what does ceasing mean? All you scholars in this room, it means stopping. Pray without stopping. And I've always heard, you know, the analogy that you can think about something without stopping. Like when you're in a relationship and it's a new relationship, you can think about that person and you can think about it all the time. But I was listening, not to steal from Jeremy Pearson's, but I was listening to him the other day and he mentioned the scripture and he said, what is pray without ceasing? He said, one of the things that we have to think about, we think about prayer as constantly speaking to God, but a lot of prayer is listening. You can listen all the time. You can be listening no matter what you're doing, whether you're having, what you're going about your day. And, I, you know, thinking about this, you can be listening, you know, you're doing the dishes and you're listening to God. God's talking to you. You're having a conversation with somebody. 
oh my gosh, you better be listening. Because have you ever been in a conversation where you're like, okay, God, what do I say? I need to know the right thing to say. I had a conversation just not long ago where I'm thinking, God, I need wisdom because I don't know what to say. I'm going to say the wrong thing because I'm pretty stupid on my own and I say the wrong thing. But I can stop and I can listen and be like, all right, God, they just said this. All right, what should I say back? Take a second, but prayer is constantly listening. Yes, you have to talk to God. You need to be speaking with him, but we do a lot more talking than we do listening. Even in our human relationships, we're bad about this. I mean, you've done, I, I just, you ever been in a conversation and someone's talking to you and, and you're just like oh, ready to say what you want to talk about? You guys ever been there? All of us get there. You're so excited and you want to like share what you know. And so you, they barely stop what they're talking about. And you're like, oh, and, and you start talking about what you have to talk about. So we have to practice this, that listening, a conversation is listening, is seeing what God wants to say for us. Um, and the next verse says, in everything give thanks. It does not say for everything. There are things that are bad that happen in our lives, but it says, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So I want to stop just for a second, look back at the first verse, verse 16, and it says, rejoice always. Does anybody know the definition of rejoice? Oh, if you've been here for any time, you better know the definition of rejoice. It means to brighten up, to leap, and to spin about. You guys know that? If you've been here, I'm sure you've heard that before. So I'm going to make us all practice. There you go, Dad. All right. Everybody stand up. <laughs> or get as, you know, movement as you can. Smile. Can Smile. Brighten up. All right. We're going to leap. Leap. And spin about. I can't leap very well. <laughs> spin about. And that is rejoicing. How many of you feel just a little bit better now that you've rejoiced for a second? I do. It feels good. And we're laughing because you know what? There's a little bit of party that's like, it's kind of embarrassing. I don't really want to do this, especially if you're a teenager when everything's embarrassing. I just don't want to do this. Somebody's going to be looking at me. You know what? Yeah, well, it's just everybody, everybody in this room has been a teenager and been embarrassed. And maybe even an adult and been embarrassed before. Preteens, preteens get embarrassed too. I'm amazed how quickly it happens. I'm amazed watching a little kid Little kids don't get embarrassed. They do some of the dumbest things in public, and they don't care. And then some point, you watch, and you start seeing that, all right, everyone's looking at me. I can't do this anymore. i got to behave a certain way. You know, and you lose, you lose a lot of joy because you start to worry what everybody else is thinking about you. But the, the scripture, the rejoice, does mean that. It means to brighten up. If you're going to rejoice, you know, people are like, yeah, I'm, I'm happy. I'm the happiest person you've ever seen. Well, sometimes... If you're happy and you know it, then your faith will really show it. You know that? If you're happy and you know it, <laughs> you can do all those things. But that's what rejoice means. And man, my dad loved to make us rejoice. And I think when I was a teenager, I hated to rejoice. Actually, though, just in case you're wondering, the worst sermon he ever preached, just in case you need this tidbit from me, is when he preached from Micah. Is it Micah? It's where it says, don't um, rejoice over me, my enemies. Though I fall, I shall arise. And most of you were not here. A few of you, maybe Nathan. We're here back then. I don't know, Stephen, Janet, right? right? He used to fall on the ground. He used to literally fall and lay there and say, I can't get up. I can't, you know, and I'd be like, I think I was, I don't know, 16. I'd be like, Dad, oh my gosh, Dad, just get up. Just stop laying on the floor. Um, but yeah, it was a good time. It was good for me. If you have never had your dad be a preacher, you guys don't know what you're missing. You teenagers, you think you got it hard? Man, if your parents get up here and share every detail about your life, that was hard. I used to be like sermon illustrations, but it was really good for me, <laughs> and uh, it, it really helped me. So yeah, if your parents give you a hard time and embarrass you, you know they embarrass. You know why your parents embarrass you? Because you embarrass them. <laughs> so they get to do all kinds of fun stuff to embarrass you now. <laughs> get to have a good time because you know when you get older, you don't ca you don't care as much, right? Sometimes. I remember I went with Thomas somewhere, and I don't know, I was talking to somebody. He's like, could you just be quiet? And I'm like, I'm not embarrassed. I can, I can talk to this little kid doing the checkout thing. I don't know what I was telling him. And Thomas was like, oh, my gosh, I don't know you. But, yeah, that was, that was what it was like growing up with my dad. He would fall on the floor and do great stuff like that. But that is what rejoice means. So you, any time you're having a bad day, you wake up tomorrow. All right, let's say Monday morning because maybe tomorrow won't be so bad. But you wake up Monday morning, and you're getting ready to go to work. And if you're not going to work, you're getting ready to do your normal routine. And everything's, you know, going topsy-turvy, and things aren't working well, and 
you know, somebody spills a bunch of stuff on the kitchen floor and you go to work and there's a, you know, bad traffic. Oh man, traffic. You know, you can rejoice then too. It says rejoice. When was it? Always. And pray without ceasing and in everything give thanks. And I looked up the word give thanks just because I was curious and I like definitions. And the Greek word is eucharisto and it means to be thankful. But it says a little bit further, it says properly acknowledging that God's grace works well. And I loved that. And it works for our eternal gain and to his glory. And it, it says literally it means thankful for God's good grace. And I don't know about you, but I am thankful for God's good grace. So it says when we are giving thanks, we are acknowledging his grace in our lives. We are acknowledging what he has already done for us. We're acknowledging um, who he is. I don't know about you, and I got, I got a lot. I think the Lord's been showing me about being great, great, grateful and thankful, and I think I've got further things I want to talk about. But I don't know how many of you like to be around people that don't give thanks. We'll just start there. You, you know, you do something for somebody, and they don't give you thanks. And it's not that you have to have thanks. It's just the acknowledgement of it. It's just the, hey, I did something for you. You don't, need, you don't need somebody to be like, oh my gosh, you're so amazing. But, okay, we'll start with your kids. Sometimes you do something for your kids and you do all these really nice things for them. And you know what they do at the end of it? They complain. And they tell you something they didn't like about it. And they're like, oh, well, it would have been better if. And you're like, oh, are you serious? I just spent all this money and we just did all these nice things and you're not thankful. Well, I think that's how God is with us. God is like, you know, and I'm going to go into this, but God's given us all these things, and all we can do is be like, well, God, it wasn't enough. I need more. Jesus wasn't enough. I need something else today. You know, I mean, we're not saying that consciously, and I, I don't know if I'll get to it tonight, but the children of Israel, man, they were, and, and you know that in case you look at the children of Israel and think, man, what a bunch of whiny losers. The Bible says that he put them in there for our example, as an example to us. Because he knows we're just like that. Without him operating in our lives, we're just like that. And I have been really challenged just in the last couple of weeks since God's been really teaching me about this, how many times I start to not be thankful. I said to Tom last night, I said, I'm just going to vent and tell you something. And then I was like, no, I'm not going to vent. I'm going to just tell you what I'm thankful about. Because my first inclination in the situation was to, be like, to tell him everything that was wrong about it. Um, but it says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. Um, Philippians 4.4, 4, you don't need to turn there. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So it is possible to be rejoicing constantly. And I think it's that constant decision. Just like when we stood up and we brightened up and we leapt and we spun about, it's that decision of I'm going to walk in this gratitude and in this thankfulness because you might not be happy in your situation. There might be some bad things that have happened. Has anybody had anything bad happen to them this week, today, that you weren't particularly happy about, things that you didn't like? But there is something that we can be thankful for. We can, there's something that we can find that God, for God's grace that's working well in us. Um, if you go on to further down in Philippians, if you go to verse Philippians 4, verse 5, but I'll just keep reading it to you. It says, Let your gentleness be known to all men, the Lord is at hand. And this is one of my favorite scriptures. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And if you were ever wondering what the first sermon, if you weren't there for the first sermon I ever preached, that was the first sermon I ever preached was from Philippians. And if you've never heard the story, I'm going to tell you because it amuses me every time. I was 14 years old, and my parents were going out Christmas shopping. And we had Wednesday night. This was back when people went to church on Wednesdays. I know, y'all didn't even know. People used to go to church on Wednesdays, guys. We used to also have prayer meetings on Tuesdays. Sometimes we had, like, a Friday night meeting. Like, this, this new, like, way of doing church, I think Wednesdays are, like, even most churches once a month. We used to go to church all the time. It's just what we did. And we had a Wednesday night service, and he was going out shopping. And I don't know why I said it to him. I said, well, who's, who's talking tonight? And what made me say that to him? And he said, you are. And he walked on out the door and went shopping. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, shoot, I'm talking tonight. I thought he was serious. So I go and I get my Bible and I get some, you know, scriptures and I come up with this whole, I still actually think I have my handwritten notes 
from when I was 14 years old. And he comes home, and he finds out that I thought he was serious. And I was like, oh, no, no, I don't, I don't need to do it. And he was determined from that point on that because I prepped, I was talking. And he made me talk. And there you go. Here, it's been that way ever since. But that was the first thing I ever talked about. But I love that scripture. It says, be anxious for nothing but in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. So even when we're making our requests known to God, even when we are doing our part of the praying, the talking, it says you need to be doing it with thanksgiving. Talk, coming to God with thanksgiving. Because, man, don't you appreciate if someone comes to you and they want something and they're grateful and thankful and not telling you what they owe, you owe them or whining and complaining, not that children or anybody in your house would do that. But sometimes... And that's what he's saying, come with thanksgiving. Come, um, come, glad, come with gratitude towards everything that he's given you. And if we've been talking about things to think about, the Bible's going to tell us in verse 8 things to keep in your ma- mind. It says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue or if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, do these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So if you're ever wondering, what should I be thinking about? God was kind enough to give you a list. He was kind enough to give you some things to think about. He said, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, good things. And you know that you can stop a bad thought, a negative thought, a complaining thought. It can come into your brain, and you can stop it. And how do you stop that thought? You guys know how to stop a thought? I'll tell you a really good way, all right? I want everybody to start counting in their head from 1 to 10. Start counting in your head. Don't say it. Don't count out loud. Just start counting in your head, 1 to 10. Now I want you to say your name out loud. Out loud. What happened to your counting? It stopped. And you have probably heard that because I've heard it 100 times before. But how basic is that and how much do we need that in our lives? When those thoughts, when the thoughts of whatever it is, unrighteousness, unholiness, unforgiveness, unthankfulness, they come into you, into your brain, the thing that you need to do is stop those thoughts by speaking. And what do you need to speak? You ought to know this one. You need to speak the word of God. And you need to say, no, the Bible says, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. No, the Bible says that that kid that just screwed up in my house, you know what they are? They're the righteousness of God in Christ. And that's what I started confessing over people. It, my mom mentioned Jeremy's sermon. Oh, man, I've learned so much from this, guys. It has been, i got a long way to go. i got a lot of things to work on. But when we look at people and we look and see that they are the righteousness of God in Christ, that changes the way we deal with somebody. And, you know, he brought up the fact, well, what if, what if so-and-so is not saved? And he goes, well, then you look at them and you say, Jesus made them, and they can be the righteousness of God in Christ. He loved them. He has a plan for them. Every person, as weird as it is to think, because we look and we think, there's no way, this person. Jesus died for them too. And as we start to see people that way, as we start to change our thoughts, and this is not what I want to talk about, but it's just kind of coming out. We can change the way we deal with people. That we look at somebody and we say, you know what? You're the righteousness of God. It might not seem like it right now, but that's what the Bible says. The Bible says you are the righteousness of God in Christ. And I love he also said this. And now I'm going to have to go in the other room because I don't want to see you right now. And that, sometimes you've got to do that. Sometimes you've got to be like, I'm, you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and go away because right now if I look at you, I'm not thinking good thoughts. But we can think, we can think these thoughts. And gratitude is something we have to, to, to be um, intentional about. Go over to, I think it's Corinthians. Go over to, I think I've got my notes here. Hold on. Corinthians first. Hold on. My notes are sticking together, guys. Sticking together. The paper. I can't stand looking my fingers to pull paper apart either. It's a personal pet peeve of mine. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Look at verse 2 Corinthians 9, 15. 2 Corinthians 9, 15. And we're going to start here, but then we're going to actually back up and read a little bit more. It says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Don't you guys love the word indescribable? It's so great. He says, he, the Apostle Paul says, his gift is so great that I can't even describe it, is indescribable. And what gift, could he, what gift is he talking about here? Well, I think there's a number of gifts he could be talking about. He could be talking about Jesus. Man, what an indescribable gift that was. Can you imagine what that took for God to send his only son to die on the cross? My mom pointed out during the song, and, and I loved it. She said, the song says, Lord, you know the hearts of men, and still you let them live. 
That's the psalm says. Can you imagine what, you know, what that means? That God knows who you were and he knows the thoughts that you've had. I mean, we can all pretend sometimes. You know, we can get up here and, you know, we can talk in church and have a good time. But God knows those secret things that you think. And he still sent Jesus. And he still loved you. And it says it is his indescribable gift. What are some other indescribable gifts that he's given us? He's given us his word. I mean, man, what an ind- Do you know how many people died for this book? I mean, that alone is an indescribable book. There are men and women who sacrificed their lives. I don't think we... I don't, I don't, we don't appreciate it. We live in a world where it's, we have a Bible. I mean, man, you probably have 20 Bibles at your house. You, and if you don't have a Bible, you have a phone. And if you don't have a phone, you got, you know, every, we are so blessed. And we don't know that the, pe- the people, that men and women that died so that you could be holding this. I mean, what an indescribable gift. Even the Old Testament, you know, even when you look at people in the Old Testament, they didn't have all of this the way you do. You know, when, when uh, Joshua was talking about meditating in the law of the Lord day and night, when God tells Joshua to meditate in his law, he's telling him to meditate in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, guys. Like, if you ever want to go to sleep, just pull out Leviticus and start to read, and you might go to sleep right then. That might help you. But that was the law, and we are so blessed. We have all of this. That's an indescribable gift. And it's one I don't think we appreciate enough. Man, we are in a country where we can have it. You know, how many, how many people around the world can't even have a Bible? You know, you hear stories about men and women in the Middle East or in, in China that get copies of the Bible, like sections of it, and have to, like, memorize it as fast as they can so that they can have God's Word in our heart. This is an indescribable gift. So when you get up tomorrow morning, you pick this up, and you may be like, man, thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. What a, what a gift he gave us. He gave us a gift of righteousness. That is an indescribable gift. That no matter what I've done, no matter how I've screwed up, because of Jesus' sacrifice, I can, be, I can be right with God. I can go into that holy of holies that that veil was torn. So I can go in. What an indescribable gift. But this chapter is actually talking about a different type of gift, and I don't know that we have time to get into all of it. But the Apostle Paul is actually, I know my time's flying, the Apostle Paul was actually talking about an offering that he was taking up in this, in this chapter. And, he, and he's going to start, like in verse 10, talking about the seed to the sower and bread for food and multiplying so that you can increase. You guys know the scripture he's talking about, you know, giving and a multiplication coming back. But look at verse, um, so he's, he's talking about giving. He's talking about an offering. And look at verse 11. So 2 Corinthians 9, 11. So let's back up. While you are enriched in, every, um, in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. So he's like, you've been enriched in everything for generosity, for liberality. And that this lab- liberality, this generosity, is causing thanksgiving to God. As we're giving this offering, as God has given to us and we are able to give this offering, um, we're able to be thankful towards God because of everything that he's done for us. Uh, If you go to verse 12, it says, For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through um, through many thanksgivings to God. So not only do we get to be thankful, do you know that giving can make other people thankful? Not only is like your giving helping you, other people around you could be like, thanks be to God, look at this stuff. You know, have you ever seen something amazing happen, somebody do something, give to somebody, and it causes thanksgiving in your own heart? So he's saying, look at all this. But as, as we're giving and as God has given to us general, uh, generously, we are being thankful to God because we're like, wow, look at all this. Look what you've done. Look what you've given to us. Um, and it, it's going on with, and it's going to end with that scripture, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. But I was going to read you this verse out of uh, a different version that I actually never read. It's from the NIV, and it's verse 11. It says, this service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing and many expressions of thanks to God. So as we're giving and we're being thankful, it says there's an overflow. How many of you guys like an overflow in your life? And I think he, he's talking about an overflow of thanksgiving. And I kind of mentioned it in the beginning. Is this an overflow of thanksgiving? Standing like this, being in church, you know, wherever I am, like, mm, I'm thankful, I'm grateful, I'm excited. Praise the Lord. An overflow of thanksgiving. Have you ever been, has somebody ever done something amazing for you? And you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you just did that. That's amazing. And what he's saying, he's like, when you see what God's done, when you're giving to him, 
because of what he's given to you, there ought to be an overflow of thanksgiving coming out of you. There ought to be something that's overflowing that is not just inside of you. You know, like I said, if you're happy and you know it, we ought to really see it. It ought to be coming out of you. It ought to not just be thoughts of thanksgiving in here. It ought to be thoughts that are coming out of your mouth, praising God for all the wonderful things that he's done for his indescribable gift. I mean, I, as, you, as you see God and you see all the amazing things that he's done and you become truly grateful, you know what's going to happen? You're going to start telling everybody, man, you don't know what God did for me. You don't know. We haven't done testimonies in this church a lot, but that's, that's what testimonies are. It's getting up and saying, man, praise God. You don't know what he did for me. You know, this, this is what happened and God showed up. That's giving thanks. It's letting us know what's in here and that overflow that's coming out. It's not just, you know, in our thoughts, oh, I'm so thankful. God's so wonderful. If he's so wonderful, you ought to be coming in and being excited. Hey, this overflow, this is what God has done. This is, this is who he is in my life. This is, you know, what he's given me. And as you give an offering, man, you think about your offering as a thanksgiving to God. As you give, and I'm not saying, you know, where you have to give. I'm not trying to get you to give here. But that giving, that praise the Lord, look what you've done for me, that I'm able to give it to somebody else, that I'm able to bless somebody else. And that is thanksgiving. You know, entering to, into God's presence with thanksgiving and saying, thank you. Let me show you thanks by, by giving. Because you know what God did? He gave. It said, God so loved the world that he gave. And if you are, if you are flowing with him, if you are renewing your mind and changing your thoughts, that thanksgiving is going to overflow out of you into, into your, your actions and your speech and, your, and even in your giving. Um, go over to, and I'm, I'm running out of time, so this will probably be where I wrap up, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. And I'm just going to start for the sake of time, and you all can catch up. Ephesians 4, 17. It says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, and the futility of your, their mind having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the blindness of their hearts. So he's saying here, you are different than everybody else. You no longer, and we talked about that last week with holiness, you no longer get to walk and act and be like everybody else. There is a difference. It's his grace that makes us holy, but because of his grace, it says his grace teaches us, we're walking in this. It says your understanding, um, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their hearts. And keep going. Who, being past feeling and given themselves over to lewdness, to work all on cleanliness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. Keep going. And if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust. Okay, stop there right there. Put off. When you guys hear when you put off the former man, what do you think? You think of getting rid of something. All right? I just put off my jacket. Took it off. Don't put it on. I need it. Yep, my microphone. Thanks. Excuse me, my microphone's there. All right, so now I put it back on, but don't put back on your old man. Put off is to get rid of something. Put off your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, <clears throat> and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's taking us back to Romans chapter 12, the renewal in the spirit of your mind. Keep going. And that you, here we go, put on, to put something back on, the new man which was recreated according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So he's like, there's some things that you don't get to do anymore. There's some ways you don't get to behave anymore. There's some conduct and things you don't get to do, and you have to put that off. And now you have to put on the new man. Um, therefore, putting away lying. Ooh, lying. You know, you don't get to lie. You don't, you're not supposed to be lying as a believer. This is something that we're done with. You know, that, that not even that, that fake, false, being honest and speaking the truth, not harshly, because speaking the truth in love doesn't mean tell everybody every thought that you have. Because, dear Lord, that, don't do that. Speaking the truth in love means looking at somebody and saying, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That is the truth in love. The truth in love isn't, man, you're an awful, horrible sinner, and everything's bad about you, and you need to cut that smoking, drinking, cussing, whatever out. The truth is you are righteous, and you are holy because of what Jesus has done. But it says, don't be lying. Let each of you speak truth with his neighbor. 
for we are members of one another. <clears throat> Be angry and do not sin. Oh man, guys, this is a hard one. Be angry, but don't sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. So when you are angry and you sin and you let the sun go down on your wrath, you're letting the devil have a place because those are the places where the devil likes. He likes contention, he likes fighting, he likes anger. So if you want to keep, this is a freebie. If you want to keep him out of your life, don't fight. Get that out, quick. If you've got to be the person that goes and says, I'm wrong, I'm sorry, you know, I repent. You know, maybe you weren't, but you got to get it straight. You go be the person to get it straight because you don't want the devil to have place in your life. Get it out. Stop it before it starts. Be the one that goes humbly and says, I, you know, I'm going to get this fixed. Uh, let's, you know, forgive and move on because you don't want the devil to have place. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands. Um, what is good that he may have something to give to him who has need? Keep going. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good and necessary for edif what is good for necessary edification, that it may part impart grace to the hearers. So it says your words should be impart in grace. Do all your words impart grace to people? Mine do not, guys. I got to really work on that. That the things that come out of your mouth ought to be bringing grace to other people. Keep going. That was a freebie as well. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit by of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Keep going. Does that take me to? Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Keep going. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Uh, keep going. <clears throat> Does that take me to chapter 5? That might take me to chapter 5. Okay. Takes you a second. All right, I want to go into chapter 5, but it takes him a second to take from one chapter to the next. So I will just take you over there and get you started. Oh, he's got it. All right. Therefore, okay, a little hint. If you ever see the word therefore, Kenneth Hagin said, you stop and you see what it's there for. But we've already done that. We've gone back and he's talking about taking off the old man, putting on the new man and how to act. And he said, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Keep going. And walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Keep on. But fornication and all uncleanliness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as it is not fitting for the saints. So he's saying, man, you guys need to get this stuff out of here. I'm going to agree fornication and uncleanliness and covetousness, that, that needs to be out of the church. We agree? He said, don't even let it be named among you. Don't even talk about it. That's how bad it is. Um, it's not even fitting. Keep going. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather give thanks. And I think if you present this to the church world, we're going to be like, yeah, get fornication out. Get uncleanliness, covetousness. Those are bad. And then when he says, no foolish talking. And I'm sure you've, re I'm sure you've heard this before, but the words foolish if you look up foolish talking in the Strong's Concordance, is the word morologia, which means um, moronic. Don't talk like a moron. Don't talk like a moron. Literally, he's saying no moronic talk. And you guys ever heard some moronic talk? All you, I mean, Lord, I'm sure you've participated, but all you gotta do is be around a, sorry guys, a bunch of teenagers, and there's some crazy stuff. Young kids, there's some crazy stuff flying. But even adults, you ever been in a conversation and at the end of it you're like, oh man, I feel dumber at the end of that. Moronic talk. It says, nor coarse jesting. And if you were here two weeks ago, my mom talked to you some about coarse jesting. The idea of jokes and thinking things are funny, you know, and you know, oh, oh yeah, we don't want to do that unless we're talking about the President of the United States and then it's okay, right? <laughs> right? Then it's okay. It's okay to make fun of him. No, it's not. It says, keep it, it says, no coarse jesting, no foolish talk. That ought to not come out of your mouth as a believer. There ought to be things that you just don't say, that you ought to be able to talk differently. You ought to be having a different speech. Um, if, you, if you read the definition for the foolish talk again, it says speech that flows out of a dull, sluggish heart and mind that has lost its edge and grip on reality. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be dull and sluggish. I don't want a mind that's lost its... The, the talk of fools involving foolishness and sinning. Any of you ever taken place in some moronic talk? I have. Some stuff where you're like, I ought to not have said that. And I think as, a, as believers, 
we have to remember to put on gratitude. And I didn't even really touch gratitude. This was just my introduction. But to put on gratitude and to stop this foolish talk um, and jesting and coarse talking. Keep going to the next verse. I think I want the next verse. Uh, For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of God. Oh, no, I think I stopped where I wanted to stop. I think you're good. But hold on what I'm looking for. Oh, yeah. No, verse, verse 7. That's where I wanted to, verse 7. It says, therefore, do not be partakers with them. We need to escape and not be involved in that. You know, it, said, it starts with fornication and, and, and um, covetousness, but it ends with foolish talk. And it says you should be giving thanks instead. Uh, if you looked at, if you look at the Aramaic Bible in plain English, which I had never looked at until I found it today, it says neither abusive language, nor worthless words, nor of disgrace, nor of nonsense, the things that are unnecessary, but in place of these, thanksgiving. And I am running out of time, but what we're going to talk about next time, it's time for me to share, the Lord willing, is that gratitude replaces that complaining, coarse jesting. You know, you know what? There, there are things in your life, you know, you look, at, you look at this country and you might see things that you dislike. You might say, oh, man, the Congress is stupid, or this is that, and this. And instead of, it, it, could you look in the natural and see everything that's wrong with the world? Yes. But instead of saying that, it's saying you need to be um, giving thanks and say, you know what? Thank you, Lord, that I live here and that you have me ready for such a time as this. There is something to give thanks for always. And I, I had somebody say something to me, and when they said it to me at first, I was kind of, I thought it, they were just really rude that they said it to me. But then I've previously, since then I've had people say something further. You know, I had one friend tell me, oh, well, your dad died, and I'm really sorry, and that's really bad, but you know what? At least you had a dad. And when she said it to me, I was like, well, I don't really want to talk to you right now. That's just kind of, you know, yeah, that's nice. But I feel like God has been challenging me. Hey, man, you know what? It's really awful, but at least you had a wonderful dad. And so when those thoughts come to me and I start to feel something, I remember to say, you know what? Thank you, God, that I did. Thank you that he was here. Thank you that he loved me. Thank you that he was such a good dad. So when you have something happen, you need to look and say, you know what? Thank you, God, that you're God. Thank you that at the end of this, nations rage and, the, you know, and things happen, but you are God and that you laugh at the plans of men. Thank you, God, that by your stripes I'm healed, even though I don't feel healed right now. Thank you, God, that my family is the righteousness of God in Christ, even though I don't see it, even though I got this family member that's not behaving the way they should. Thank you, God, that your word says this. Thank you, God for what you've done for me. Thank you, God, for the air that I breathe, for for what a good, good father you are. Thank you that you have given me all things that pertain unto life and godliness. You have that indescribable gift that we were reading in 2 Corinthians, an indescribable gift. And so for the rest of your life, if Jesus did nothing for you, except what he's already done, you have a lifetime, an eternity of things to be thankful for. There is always something that we can find in our lives to say, thank you, God. Thank you for all the wonderful things. You know what? Thank you for this church. Thank you for the people in here. Thank you for the food that we're going to have. Thank you for everything that you've given us. And as you put on thankfulness, you can walk out of some of those other things, that foolish talk, that coarse talk, the, the, uh, the for, uh, fornication, things like that. If you're thankful for what you have, you're not going to be coveting what someone else has. If you're thankful for your spouse, you're not going to be going into fornication because you're thankful for your spouse. You cannot be complaining about your children and be thankful for your children at the same time. You cannot be complaining about your job and be thankful that you have a job at the same time. You cannot be complaining about the country that you live in and be thankful for all the wonderful things that we do have in this country, that you are still free to read this. You cannot be thankful and complain at the same time. If you want to live a life of success, if you want to be thankful, if you want to live for God, you have to put on Put on gratitude. Put on thankfulness. And I've barely scratched the surface. I think a lot of things that God's been showing me. But putting it on and saying, you know what, I'm going to be thankful. So just start here this week. You know, something happens and it's bad. And you stop and you want to talk about what bad, what bad thing it was. And you say, you know what, I'm going to find something to, thank, to be thankful about first. You ever seen the movie Pollyanna? And she plays the glad game. That's what you're going to do. Instead of playing the glad game. So Pollyanna, if you ever saw Pollyanna, it was, I don't even know. 
I don't even know when that movie was, way back when. But Pollyanna always finds something to be glad about. And she's always, oh, I'm glad for this. And, and people make fun of her. And she ends up changing people. I think she lives with her aunt. And she ends up help changing her aunt because they see that they have something to be glad for. Well, you have any more than glad. You have something to be thankful for. So you need to be playing the thankful game this week. As you get up, find something to be thankful for. You know what? I don't, I'm up early, but you know what? Praise God, I woke up. <laughs> Praise God, I'm here. Praise God, you know, my, my, you know, kids, your mom makes something you don't want for dinner, and you're like, whoa, do we have to eat mushrooms? My house, mushrooms. I like the mushrooms, man. I don't even know what it is about mushrooms. They see it in everything I make, whether it's there or not. Be thankful that your mom made you dinner because there are kids literally that don't have dinner tonight. And you think, well, then send it to them because I don't want it. You ever do that? <laughs> no, you do. If you went all, you know what? If you went long enough, man, those mushrooms would look amazing. You ever, guys, you ever fasted for a while? And uh, it doesn't matter what you see. That is the best looking food you've ever seen. I, I remember the first fast I ever had. Somebody, I was, a, we had a fast at our church. It was a, they asked us to do a 24-hour fast. And I don't remember if I was 12 or 13. And I signed, they asked everybody to take a day. And I signed up for my day. And we went to a friend's house, and they ate peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And at the time, I did not really like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I don't know what's wrong with me because they're really good, but I didn't like them. And I remember sitting there thinking, man, that's the best-looking food I've ever seen. I was really thankful for the next thing I got to eat. So find something to be thankful for. You know, when something's going wrong, you know what? Thank God that, you know, I'm here. Thank God that I'm breathing. Thank God that I'm, that I'm standing. Thank God. Find something because there is something to be thankful for. And as you put on thankfulness, and I'm going to talk about this later, I think, as you start to put on thankfulness, you start to see your relationship with God change. You start to see blessing, and you start to see things happening. Because, you know, I'm going to give you a little hint. You know something God does not like? And it's probably the same thing you don't like at your house. God does not like complaining. And can you blame him? Because you do not like complaining. Not when you do it. When you do it, it's different. Like when we complain, it's totally okay. But when other, you ever been around somebody and they're complaining and you're like, oh, dear Lord, stop talking. Just I don't want to hear you complain about whatever it is. That's God. And we're going to read some scriptures that shows how much God dislikes complaining in the future. But as you put on that thankfulness, um, look over real quick. I know my time's up. Look over real quick in James chapter 3. I'm going to end this with James chapter 3. Verse, uh, I don't know, start with chapter, verse 1. Uh, and you know the scriptures James is talking about your tongue in verse, in verse um, 2. James 3, verse 2. And he said, For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, also able to bridle the whole body. Keep going. Indeed, if we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us and we turn their whole body. I, I'm going to stop because I'm really running out of time. But he's talking about how our mouths, if we can control our mouth, we can control our whole body. If we can control this, you know, the, David said in the Psalms, put a watch on my mouth, O Lord. And that's what most of us need to pray. Lord, help, us, help me just not talk. Until you can get the thankfulness coming out, let me just, let me just be quiet. But if you look down at verse, um, verse 8, it says, But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless God our Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not be so. And I just want to end with this because we, I know I'm out of time. As we are putting on thankfulness, we need to be really careful to remember. We cannot say, glory to God, God is amazing. Man, I hate this person over here. We got to be careful with our words of thanksgiving. We got to be careful to guard our mouth as we're, as we're going about our day. Because he said, you cannot bless God and be cursing someone else at the same time. So what I said earlier, you cannot be complaining and be thankful at the same time. You've got to stop that complaint. You've got to stop those curses, and you've got to find something to be thankful for. And you say, what if you say there's, what if there's like nothing to be thankful for? You know what? You pray, and you sit and wait till God tells you something. You sit there, because God can find you something. And if all you can say was, Jesus died for you, then that's enough, because Jesus thought they were worth it. Jesus looked and said, their life is worth it. And he died for them. And so you ought to think the same thing. But as we put on gratitude, we start to see a whole new world. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go one day to talk more about what God... He, I'm so excited, the things that he's been showing me, and I'm excited to share with you. But it's a challenge because he's called me on it a couple of times when I've gone to say something. And he's like, is that really what you want to say? Do you really want to be complaining or do you want to put on gratitude? 
is that really what you want to say? Do you really want to talk about how that bed at the hotel is really awful? Or do you want to be thankful that you get to go on vacation like a rich person? You know, what do you want to do? What do you want to put on? And I, I want you to encourage this week to put on gratitude, to put on thankfulness, and to, let, to, to see everything that God, that indescribable gift that he's been given us, and that he has given us, and be thankful for it. So let's pray, because I'm way over, and the kids are probably anxious. Father, I thank you for this evening. God, I, I'm so grateful and thank you, thankful for who you are, and help me to be even more thankful. Help me to be even more grateful for everything that you've done, for me to put on that gratitude and to put on thanksgiving in my heart towards you and towards everything that you've done and towards the people around me, and that you would show us just in simple ways what it means to put on gratitude and what it means to be thankful and what it means to walk in rejoicing always and praying without ceasing. I ask you to bless our um, fellowship tonight and bless our food. And